what I can't understand really is why there are so few people and by extension, so few companies um, that actually have a wish for the future. I mean, how the future should look like. What world do they actually want to live in? Because, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, the pandemic has shown us that you can't just take the current world for granted. And quite frankly, the current world isn't that great. I mean, there's a lot of things you could actually improve. Concrete things that you and your children will actually appreciate. So why are there so few people out there who actually say, yeah, actually, let's build a world, you know, that is like this, you know, like I envision it. And maybe we can disagree on the visions, but, you know, I prefer people with visions a hundredfold to people who just sit there and say, yeah, you know, let's see what comes. And, you know, if something comes, then maybe I react. Yeah. And that's, I think, one of the biggest issues when in mature industries and in mature markets and in mature countries like Germany, I mean, we've gotten really, really fat and, and, um, yeah, comfortable in the status quo. And um, I think we need to change that. And maybe the pandemic is a good way to remind us that uh, we can't take um, the world for granted. And maybe there's actually a better world we should be working towards. Lynn Kaiser is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Lynn is working on engineering using artificial intelligence and manufacturing using 3D printers with Hyperganic, a company he co-founded in 2014. His goal is to build objects and entire machines that are as complex, sustainable, and efficient as natural objects. Lynn is a serial entrepreneur who has worked in the disruptive industries for the last 30 years in fields from industrial machines to Hollywood movie making. Lynn also is on the board of several innovative companies, for example, Izar Aerospace, a rocket launcher startup, and Volt Storage, a company that builds sustainable batteries for storage of renewable energy. Lynn also has, through his foundation, the Kaiser Forum for Sustainability, he raises awareness for environmental issues. Lynn and I have known each other for a while, seen our paths cross over the years at different speaking engagements, and uh, is just a wonderful family man living in Munich and has a, a wonderful wife and five beautiful children. And so I, I just welcome you to the show. Thanks for being here, Lynn. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Great that you have me. Thanks. It's so good that you could take the time and, and speak with us today. How long has it been now that our paths have crossed? And, and when was it the first time? Was it 2018 or 19? Where, where was it exactly? Well, that's a good question. I think it's probably 2018, you know, probably Kinonet, you know, one of these places. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, you've been doing this for well over 30 years. You're originally with uh, Adobe and have have uh, you know had your own companies, but you've always kind of been tied to cutting edge innovation, futurism, also sustainability, environment, also doing a lot of things in the digital space. Um, I I would think personally, especially one of the first companies in 1970s to, to or Otrag, I guess is how you say it, space companies ever. Um, you've always been an early innovator, a, a, a leader, a thought leader, kind of an innovator, but also not just future, but environment and kind of the sustainability thought process. Has any of that helped you to weather this crazy time we've just experienced? Lockdown, pandemics, Black Lives Matter, crazy inaugurations, you know, all that. Has that given you more resilience or did you say, well, we're, thank goodness I've already in that mindset. I'm well prepared and we've weathered this time nicely. As a family, your personal situation, uh, did that type of new model or way of you've been thinking for a long time help you get through this crazy time any better? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, 
You know, the thing is, I mean, I've seen quite a few crises, right? You know, I'm, I, I remember Chernobyl, right? You know, in, in 1986, um, when the reactor blew up and it was actually a very similar situation. You know, nobody was kind of, kind of, nobody knew what was going on and nobody knew how to react really. And also politics, you know, was kind of, yeah, at, at a loss, you know, how to deal with it. Nobody knew the science really behind it. You know, there were some assumptions and so it's so similar. So, yeah, I mean, I remember that as a kid, you know, I was a teenager back then. Um, and um, I mean, one of the interesting aspects about my personal um, uh, entrepreneurial life is that I very early had people who were ro working remotely. So I've always worked with global teams. I've always worked with people who were you know, not in the same office like me. I remember in the mid nineties sending hard drives around, you know, that was really cumbersome and dialing into ISDN modems, you know, at night, because if I dialed in at daytime, nobody could call the company anymore. So, I mean, things have come a long way. So I think, you know, as, as hyperganic, it hasn't hit us as much as it has hit some other people, because I mean, we've always been a company that uh, has a lot of people remote and, uh, you know, our standups involve a lot of Zoom meetings anyway. So it wasn't such a huge deal. As a family, yes, I mean, Wow, you know, I mean, where do you start? I mean, all this uh, homeschooling and and uh, you know, remote learning, and so so I don't think that's particularly going very ideal in Germany right now. I mean, they're they're trying their best, but um, I would I'm always surprised how um, yeah how little digitization is really in that space. You know, people are so used to kind of uh, you know chalk whiteboards and chalk and stuff, and you're like, okay, yeah, how do you bring that online? So, I mean, my wife is dealing with most of this, uh, um, and I'm dealing with the company here. But um, it is it is. Uh, I think the biggest issue is really that, uh, you know, as a kid, you have to go out and run around with other kids and, and, and you know, this has been very disrupted and you can't replace that with a Zoom meeting. So I'm a little bit worried generally, not particularly about my kids. I mean, I think they're fine. We're a big family, so they have other kids to play with. But, um, you know, for other people, I mean, if you are, you know, I don't know, a single mother or something like that right now, it must be really tough now. Uh, I imagine, and I, I we've seen so many things um, <clears throat> bubble to the surface. So it's shown the microscope on things definitely, but we've really realized, you know, where the system's broken, where we're not up to speed with the future. And you touched on one of those for sure is, you know, we, we, in our circles, we've heard of this digital transformation for a lot of years and, and, in some respects, some have thought, okay, we're, we're already there, we've done it, we're, we're moving on to the next uh, uh, emerging technologies and things. But really for me, it's like w w Germany, Europe, and many places around the world, they haven't even began to tickle the surface on the digital transformation. You know, Taiwan, in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. They've made the digital transformation. They're very up to speed with that. Um, I would like to see some of that uh, bubble to the surface and be put into our infrastructures around around the world and other places so that that uh, also becomes a human right that we really truly make that digital transformation because an, another thing that you touch upon as well with with this digital transformation is we've kind of been locked in this human zoo of ours for for a little bit longer now so we're getting getting to realize how it works for us 24 7. Do we have the digital infrastructure? Do we have enough bathrooms? Do we have enough computers? Do we have enough space that um, not that we social distance in our home own house, but that we remain sane when we're mm. on a business call or Zoom and it's got to be quiet because we're dealing with partners or or the family needs to study and they're using the same broadband and, and, and computers that you're using for work, you know, things like that, that we get this closer look at, at our living conditions that we've cre created for each other, uh, for ourselves. And we say, boy, this is just, wasn't meant for 24 seven. It wasn't meant for us 
to be a permanent situation. And that then for me kind of tickles into the di digital transition or goes even deeper that our built environment is not made this sustainable development transition where our infrastructure is not up to speed with our exponentially growing world and the problems to, to battle these. And so I would love to get a little bit more of your insight and what your future thinking is. We'll get into hypergenics, and, and, but I think there's also this transition. I mean, because of what you do, I think you have a, a, a vision of what that future, that world looks like. And um, not only how do you get there as a business, but how have you also applied that into your life so that we can make that transition to get there? Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like I said, you know, I mean, like you said, um, the, the pandemic has brought a lot of things to the surface that um, I think we always knew, but weren't maybe as urgent as they become now. I mean, if you are, I mean, in Germany, there are many places where you have very little internet access still, you know, in 2021 which is insane. Of course, it's easier to do that in Taiwan. You know, it's a much smaller country. But yeah, I mean, we are one of the richest countries in the world. Why is this still a, a problem today? And now it actually is a huge problem. Now, I think, I think you know, fundamentally, I hope that we can actually see a resurgent of uh, entrepreneurship that takes these things seriously because they, you know, the entrepreneurs see an opportunity. I mean, if you're uh, looking at what Elon Musk is doing with Starlink, you know, all of a sudden, um, I don't have to wait for some bureaucratic organization to get their act together in order to get a fiber optic cable, you know, routed to my house because I just can put up an antenna on my roof and nobody can keep me from having, you know, broadband internet access. So I think this pandemic has shown us and is still showing us that um, the way things were, business as usual, doesn't really, I mean, it's an anomaly. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that is sustainable. You know, the, the idea that I can just, you know, um, uh, you know, take it for granted that everything will just work, you know, and uh, there's uh, no disruption, you know, to my infrastructure, I can just go on vacation four times a year, you know, all of these things that we've taken for granted. I mean, it's actually stuff that we have to work for. It's not, uh, you know, something that is a human right or anything, you know, it, it, it is something that we have to actually achieve. And if you look at stuff like climate change, you know, I mean, there are things coming down the road that have the potential to disrupt this on a completely different level than this pandemic. The pandemic is only a virus. So if we have vaccinations, if we, if we kind of kill that virus, then we are, yeah, we can go back to normal. But, you know, I mean, some of the things that are happening with climate change are irreversible. So there is no way you get your coast back once it's eroded. You know, there is no way, you know, you can run a nuclear power station, you know, if uh, there is no water in the river, you know, or the water is too hot and these kinds of things. So there are some things that can't be reversed, you know, with the vaccination. And so what encourages me is that I see people now, um, who are entrepreneurs who are thinking about these problems in an entrepreneurial way. So they don't see, a, oh my God, there's a disaster coming to me and I can't do anything about it. They're looking at it and say, okay, there's an opportunity for me to build a business around it. And so you see people building business around carbon capture. You see people building business around uh, renewable energy storage. You see people building businesses uh, around you know, distributed manufacturing you know, where you don't have supply chains that have single points of failure. So you're, you're seeing a resurgence of entrepreneurs who actually want to get somewhere. You know, I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs today who just want to kind of fit into the existing pro, uh, uh, system. So they're, they're kind of seeing, okay, what's happening? What's happening? Okay, you know, how do I fit in there? But this is really not what entrepreneurship is about. Entrepreneurship is about saying, how do I want the world to look like in a couple of years? What kind of world do I want to live in? And how do I build this? And this has become exceedingly rare. It was much more 
common after World War II because, well, you know, who wanted to live in the world that, you know, at least in Europe, you know, existed after World War II? It was terrible. So yeah, everybody the wanted to get somewhere. Destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody wanted to get somewhere better. And, you know, unfortunately, in the past couple of decades, we've got, gotten a little bit comfortable. Hey, it's fine like it is. You know, let's just keep it that way. You know, that's enough. But, uh, you know, this kills human progress. And, um, you know, obviously, it doesn't deal with the challenges that we have uh, coming down the road right now. And uh, I think, you know, if you look at it a little bit philosophically, um, I think uh, this pandemic has maybe helped us realize that uh, some of the things that we just take for granted are actually things that we need to work for and actually actively shape instead of just waiting what's coming down the pipe. I think it's been a huge opportunity for many to not only to see that we can pivot on a dime or on a penny and and change and, and make some drastic changes, but I um, I've been speaking about this for years and I'm sure you have, but what what I realize is it it took it took something else to kind of uh, shake humanity and economies and our lives a little bit because right after the very first lockdown uh, last in 2020, boy, my phone and my email was off the hook. All those people that I'd spoken to, they were like, help us get back to some kind of normal, help us get back up to business, help us uh, implement those things you told us about that we didn't implement. But those organizations that did implement those practices, they're like, Wow, this is the best business model ever. The sustainability and ESG is has a little bit of resilience in it. And it's such a better model in times like this because I'm prepared. And, and that leads me to kind of um, a few other questions I have for you. But a lot of people, I, I sometimes, uh, I used to say for years, I'm a sustainable futurist and, and I'm a resilient futurist. Well, people are like, well, what does the future have to do with sustainability or resilience? people under, don't understand sustainability. I think it's a buzzword. It's, you know, it's a, 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 they, they don't understand which definition of sustainability and what it truly means, but it has a lot to do with the future, foresight and, and, and good modeling. And it has a lot to do with economics. It really has to do with, uh, and, and, but a different type of economics. It's, it's one of natural capital, total environmental cost, and really this ecological economics that cannot be cheated. There's no way to cheat Earth, there are the finite resources of our planet. And so and most people don't see that bigger connection. They think that these short-term gains are, are, you know, that we can take it here and somewhere in the back end, it'll come out. But yeah, it'll come out, but in the wrong way. And so um, I just think it's so, so interesting because I, uh, people always say, boy, you know, all these innovators and these futurists, well, the reason is, is because they're really sustainable. They're thinking about how can we operate in the depths of space, the harsh conditions of there, and still survive as humanity to do it efficiently with the minimum amount of resources or the, the, the minimum amount of negative feedbacks in that closed environment that come back and kill us or choke off the oxygen or whatever the situation is, but apply those here in our business here on earth so that we can basically circular economy principles. And so uh, that, that leads me to my next question. It's really, and, and I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you and your viewpoint. Are you a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world with the removal of all borders, walls, divisions, and limitation of humanity one from another? And how does that tie to this overview effect, this cosmic perspective uh, of, of being a sustainable futurist or a resilient futurist, because you are. Yeah, um, I think this is maybe one of the most problematic aspects of this pandemic is that uh, people are now thinking that they have to do it all, to kind of hunker down and do it all alone in their little borders or region or city or four walls. And, you know, we should be doing exactly the opposite, you know, but we are not really doing it, you know, so um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously a global citizen. I mean, I work with people all over the world. I enjoy, I tremendously enjoy different cultures, you know, and uh, you know, my, my organization is incredibly diverse in all kinds of aspects. And I enjoy that because I think, you know, first of all, it's just a fun environment. You know, we have, we have lots of different people, you know, not just lots of different cultures, but lots of different characters, you know, personalities, you know, ways of thinking, you know, this makes an organization resilient and, and, and fun to work with. Um, but it's also global. And so I can see, you know, how different countries, you know, deal with, um, you know, with, with the pandemic, you know, I, you know we have, we have uh, people in China, we have people in Singapore, we have people in Argentina, we have people in Germany, Italy, you know, so, you know, basically, I've seen the full spectrum of how you can deal with that. And it's so weird that you know, it seems like nobody wants to learn from the others. You know, everybody seems that I, they, they know best, you know, you, and this is on the, on the governmental level, but it's also to a certain extent on the corporate level. And, uh, you know, this kind of always makes me a little bit sad, you know. So I think we are still headed for a world without borders. Now, what does without borders mean? It doesn't mean that everybody should have the same culture and the same way of living. So I don't think borders really are going away. I'm just thinking that the borders should be permeable. Um, and you know, if you look at what we are doing, I mean, with my company, we're trying to connect all the global brains in the world together so that they can collaborate. So sometimes people tell me, you know, yeah, but so you're, you're working with 3D printing. So this has the potential to, distri to di di distribute it manufacturing. So we can bring manufacturing home and we can produce our own masks and our own devices and whatnot. I'm like, yeah, I mean, you can do that, but that's not the point. The point is how can we as humanity connect the brightest minds of every place on earth? You know, some guy in Africa, some place, you know, that you currently don't have on their radar because you know right now there is no physical supply chain you know to a person in tanzania or kenya or whatever but they have great ideas there right you know why shouldn't they i mean there are smart people everywhere in the world so um i think what i hope is that kind of people understand that this pandemic actually is showing us the opposite it shows us how global our problems are. They are not constrained. I mean, when, when this pandemic happened in China, everybody said, oh yeah, you know, it's in China. You know, they will deal with it somehow. And look at how weird the Chinese are dealing with it. They're locking everybody in and you know, requiring everybody to wear a mask. And yeah, a couple of weeks later, boom, it was here in the middle of Germany. And all of a sudden we were required to wear masks. And you know, here we are a year later and we're still sitting at home and, uh, and can't go out. So, um, these things don't stop at borders. And so we need global citizens and a global mindset to deal with that. And so this nationalism that I see and you know, this, oh yeah, let's do it all alone. You know, let's, let's build supply chains that are only lo local. This is completely ridiculous because we need the ideas from everyone, not just from the guys you know, who are living in our neighborhood to actually deal with these kinds of crises. And so, yeah, I hope that uh, you know, it will be one of the outputs, but right now that you see a little bit the pendulum swinging the wrong way, I think. I, th I get you're definitely um, in, in the mindset uh, very similar to me. And, and um, there's always I kind of break up is that people don't understand that species don't adhere to borders. They cross borders, air, water doesn't hold to borders. The pandemic didn't hold to any borders. And food doesn't hold to any borders. Our food during the pandemic was truly really a global citizen. And then <clears throat> this other aspect of, of doing local and, and reducing the supply chains, that's fabulous. That's a super way to, to, to do great things. But this global mind or collective intelligence that we have the opportunity to grab brilliant minds and technologies and solutions and then apply more in a global situation. Yeah, we think globally, but we can apply that in a local situation where the need is much different than those of other areas. What, what, what a lot of people don't realize as well is that if you look at um, 
at the World Trade Organization, or if you look at sa satellite geospatial data of shipping supply chains or trucking supply chains or uh, city movements, uh, if you look at just the trade movements of goods and their own geospatial type of map, Boy, that really shows you the truth of what kind of a world we're in. It doesn't look anything like our traditional maps. Products are moving in the billions every single day, uh, regardless of air travel, uh, um, all around the world. And, and so that, su that supply chain, that business chain uh, uh, of trade and doing business around it has, it has continued to be a globalization and to continue to be a global citizen, so to say. But it's been that way for a long time. There's a great guy I had on, on, on my show, Dr. Uh, Parag Kana, and he shows these geospatial uh, maps of, of uh, shipping and transport and logistics from geospatial aspects in, in, in real time and moving data that, that we've collected. It's a totally different map of our world than you would imagine, but that's the that's the reality of day-to-day -day interactions. It's already global. It's been that yep. way for a long time. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. You know, um, and I think you know a part of the problem is you know that a lot of um, a lot of things are currently uh, politicized. You know, so you know we have these huge discussions. You know, here in Europe, you know, about the uh, vaccinations, uh, the vaccines from Russia and from China. And uh, you know, I'm kind of scratching my head, and I'm like, you know, do people realize that most of the vaccinations that people took in their lives were probably manufactured in China? because China is one of the largest supplier of vaccinations. So why should that particular vaccination all of a sudden be unsafe, you know? So you're kind of wondering why do people actually uh, politicize that because it does a lot of harm, you know? I mean, we could, we could, yeah, I mean, obviously these things need to be safe and they need to be um, accepted, but you know, the way it's portrayed very often, you know, it becomes very, very hotly debated without good reason. And um, that does a lot of harm. And so I hope, uh, you know, I mean, maybe also with the shift in leadership in the United States, that we can kind of get away from this polarization of the world and more towards like, you know, let's look at the differences. Yes, absolutely. Let's see the things we like and we don't like, but let's also accept all the things that we have in common. And, um, you know, there was this famous uh, Sting song, you know, um, way, way back when the Cold War was still up, you know, and, and you know, it was basically the, the song Russians. And, you know, one of the key lines were um, that um, I hope the Russians love their children, too. So there are, are, are things that, you know, every people in the world have in common. You know, they all want the best for their children. You know, they all want to live in harmony to a certain extent, you know means different things in different cultures. But, um, you know, there is no evil country on earth, really. You know, even the ones that we generally label as evil are uh, probably when you look inside, you know, just like when we actually met some Russians in the you know, 80s or whatever, we find, wow, it's interesting. These people are not evil people. You know, they don't want to kill us all. You know, so they actually also just want to live in peace. So, you know, I think, you know, people should kind of look a little bit beyond the differences and more towards the commonalities because that's kind of the recipe that we need to solve our problems together. It's really, really hard to solve a problem with someone you hate or with someone you despise or with someone you constantly vilify, you know? So you have to kind of find the commonalities and uh, yeah, well, let's see how that goes. <laughs> I, I had uh, Mark Dorf Dorfman on my podcast a while ago, and he's from Biomimicry 3.8. And uh, the reason I bring it up is I want to, so you use artificial intelligence in manufacturing of 3D printers. On, on the intelligence that uh, is initially trained, or if it is even trained into those, does, does some of that kind of mimic nature in the way the designs come up? Or the way your designs come up or, or the way that, that process is, is used, is it strictly from AI learning from itself and then coming up with the best uh, 
structural way to build certain things. And, and, and the reason I ask is, is mainly, can you tell us more about, uh, you know, some of the things that you, re, recently there's been some real positive things about going on and, and forward momentum. Can you give us kind of that insight to, to hyperganic and what's going on, what the trend is? Um, and, th and then I've got, I've got some, I definitely have some more follow-up questions uh, to, uh, around that because I, I always say uh, it's not about the brands or the products of the future, it's how you produce that'll have the biggest impact on our world. And I really think that's enveloped in hyperganics on how you do things. And, and also there's a, a form of a sustain a real sustainable aspect in, in doing things in this different way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, you know why I started Hyperganic and uh, I can dive deep into what we're doing. So if we rewind a little bit to the year 2008, you know, I, um, so you said in your, you know, when you introduced me, uh, I've been doing lots of different things. You know, I started my career in industrial machine control, you know, in the 1990s, which we wanted to disrupt with PC technology and we succeeded in disrupting. And then I went into a completely different field. You know, I helped digitize Hollywood. You know, we built the first digital cinema in the world and did image processing, you know, for the Matrix movies and basically any movie you've seen in the last 20 years. And um, it's, it was a fun ride. And it's such a privilege to be able to help with a transition from of an industry from completely analog to completely digital. But there was a guy who completely spoiled that industry for me. And that was Al Gore, because he gave his famous talk an inconvenient truth in 2008. And I saw it and it alerted me to the climate crisis. And, you know, here I was, you know, supplying Hollywood with the finest image processing algorithms that you can imagine. And I'm sitting on my sofa in my living room and I'm telling my wife, I'm, I think I'm in the wrong industry. I mean, there's this huge problem that is coming down the pipe. And I didn't know about it. I mean, I was separating my trash. So, you know, I thought, you know, the, the environmental problem is solved, you know. <laughs> and um, and there's this huge thing that nobody had ever talked about that little people have been known you know in, in academic circles for decades and decades, but you know nobody really talked about it. And it kind of spoiled my business for me because here I was you know spending all my brain power on you know providing better entertainment to people. And um, it eventually led, to me selling the company to Adobe in 2011. Uh, so it took me a few more years to actually realize uh, that I needed to be doing something else. And then during my Adobe years, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do next. And uh, one of the things that, um, so I'm a software guy. I've been doing software for 40 years now. And you know, I love software because software is one of the most creative things you can do. You can imagine something and you can build it. And there's basically nothing that can, you know, can prevent you from from building anything, right? You know, it's just you know the amount of work you put in, but there's no physical boundaries or anything. And I was always impressed with software. You know, software evolved so fast. You know, if you look at the PC technology, information technology, I mean, 10, 12 years ago, nobody used smartphones. You know, 20 years ago, very few people used the internet. You know, 30 years ago, only a few freaks had a PC, including me. And uh, if you look at the rest of the world, it's kind of in slow motion. I mean, car manufacturers got by with slapping a new Chrome label on the car every three years and said, oh, here's a new car, you can buy it now. You know? And you're kind of wondering why it doesn't consume less gas or why it still consumes gas for that matter and why it still emits CO2 and these kinds of things. So innovation in physical objects has been extremely slow. And I kind of wondered if there is something that we could do about that, because if we can dramatically accelerate innovation in physical objects, we can actually solve some of these challenges that are coming down, you know, the pipeline, you know, that, that are imminent. And I never understood how could we get the speed of Moore's law into physical object innovation. You know, how can we do that? Because it seems so complicated to build something. And so it's, it's always highly specialized and highly specific. 
And then I discovered industrial 3D printing. And uh, all of a sudden I realized, wait a second, you know, there is something where I can print something different every time the printer runs. So I can actually improve, I can change, I can adapt, you know, just like nature adapts, you know, every tree that grows adapts to its specific location. It's a little bit better than the tree that grew before. So I realized that this is the way to connect the speed of Moore's law, the speed of software with physical objects that are actually built. And that was the founding idea of Hyperganic. Let's build an ecosystem with which we can do innovation on a completely new level. Well, easier said than done. I mean, how do you actually do that? You know, so, um, uh, and you know, it was a long learning process. So we started in 2015, you know, I did some research. I traveled around, you know, talked to a lot of people in this industry and other industries and tried to figure out how things were built. Um, my co-founder started coding, you know, building a technology stack that basically moved atoms in space. So because we said, you know, if we want to represent any object a printer can print, we basically have to move, you know, every particle that the printer can output, you know, to the right location, which is something which is completely impossible with traditional software. And um, yeah, we came up with this idea that instead of, I mean, how do we currently build objects? I mean, if you think about it, we build objects like the Egyptians and the Romans. You know, we designed them like the Romans did it. You know, we, you, you come up with a plan, you draw this plan by hand. Well, back in the Roman times on, you know, papyrus or, or, or paper or whatever, parchment. And today you do it in a computer, you model it in 3D, it's kind of cool, but it's still a manual process. So there's some person sitting there modeling this thing manually and, you know, their kind of imagination determines how good that thing will be that they're going to build. Now, could we actually move that thought process, this knowledge of the engineer into an algorithm? so that the algorithm knows how to build objects of a certain kind. If you have that, then you can put the algorithm to work, you know, 24 seven, you know, on millions of computers, if you want to, if the problem is, is urgent enough, you can put it on thousands of computers or millions of computers and come up with the best idea. And if you have a new idea, this new idea instantly goes through the network and everything is updated. And it sounds completely crazy when you talk about it in physical objects, but this is completely normal in software. You know, if I come up with a better, better database, you know, instantly I can deploy this database to every um, software system that uses a database. If I come up with a better algorithm to do something, I can instantly deploy it. And if I choose the right business model, I can, you know, basically have it everywhere instantaneously. Um, in software, by the way, we are also routinely working together globally. I mean, I don't know if that person is in Romania or in Africa or, you know, wherever, you know, in the, on the globe. Um, you know, as long as the person is talented and has access to the internet, um, yeah, it's going to be fine. So we already have that. We just didn't have that in physical object um, uh, engineering. And this is basically what we've built. And, you know, if you look behind me, you know, there is a rocket engine that was actually designed using AI. And you asked about bi biomimicry. I actually have it here, you know, so we can look at it in real. So this is a, yeah, this is a metal object. And you, you, you will look at it and say, oh, wow, it looks a little bit natural, actually, you know, I mean, it's clearly man-made, but it actually looks a little bit natural. And um, the interesting thing is we didn't do biomimicry. We didn't say, oh yeah, there's this plant, let's copy what the plant is doing. We just encoded all the knowledge that a traditional rocket designer uses to actually lay out cooling channels and you know the, 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 the throat of the uh, rocket, et cetera. It's heavy, I have to <laughs> put it down. I think a matter of fact, I've touched that or seen it before at one, one of the events or Kennedy that are somewhere, I've seen that up close before. Yeah, exactly. I've been running around with it for a while. You know, this thing is now almost four years old. We, we have been mostly in stealth mode in the last couple of years, and we show it as an example. We have a lot more interesting stuff coming out, you know, this year as we roll it out to more customers. But the interesting thing is, um, if you encode um, knowledge about how things are designed optimally, you end up 
very quickly with shapes that look very organically. And this is actually not a huge surprise because what does nature do? I mean, what has nature been doing for you know, a couple of billion years now? Well, it has always optimized it to be the most resource friendly, you know, the most, uh, uh, the most efficient uh, way of doing whatever it's doing. And um, yeah, as we humans get closer to that goal using algorithmic design, using AI and algorithms, uh, the more our stuff actually resemble nature simply because, well, nature already found a good solution. Yeah. So, I mean, in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. I mean, we are designing objects using algorithms and artificial intelligence. Um, we trade them digitally. So, because now if you have the blueprint, you know, the algorithm that actually builds something, you don't have to build the physical objects in some remote place. You can actually, you know, trade it using digital means. And then, you know, hopefully close to the end consumer, we produce these objects in digital factories and these digital factories are built around industrial 3D printing. Why industrial 3D printing? Because industrial 3D printers allow us to build objects of almost unlimited complexity. And because these printers are so flexible that they don't have to be specifically built for this one object that we create. I think most people don't realize any object that you have in your hands today, there was a special machine or at least a tool built only for that one object. So if you want to change any aspect of that object, you know, like a pen or, you know, a doorbell or whatever, you have to actually also not just change the object, you also have to change the entire manufacturing process, which always makes you kind of ask yourself, do I really want to change that? Do I really want to change that? Oh, no, let's just keep it the way it is which is exactly the reason why innovation has not been happening in physical objects. And, and that is so true. I deal a lot with that in the food industry. So if I go in into any food uh, co-packer, filler, food producer, and ask them to make the products the way I want to have them and the, the same packaging I do, the, the first thing that always comes back is the limitations and the issues with their production and their manufacturing machinery that say, oh, we can't do that type of a food on, on this machinery because we can only use this type of packaging and we only have high heat processing or uh, uh, these uh, high pressure processing or we have this packaging and we can only do these type of sizes and quantities. And there's always that limitation because there's not that flexibility. And, and a lot of those in, in any industry is... Uh, the, the clean in process is very timely. The changeover for new products or new things is very unsustainable. But it, the the model that they're running on is is very outdated and it's very not inflexible and it's very high impact on on emissions and and greenhouse gases and uh, uh, other methods. And so I really like the 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 benefits that come from this new way of uh, of thinking that. I, you know, I'm, I know a little bit to, enough to be dangerous, but is, is this what Tesla and uh, Jeff Bezos and some others are using some of these 3D printers for reusable rockets or reusable parts or things that, that they're using to kind of keep up the speed and, and go faster in that whole industry? Yeah, I mean, in um, in rocketry, you know, 3D printing is well established already, you know, because I mean, some of these um, uh, geometries that we're seeing here, I mean, here for the cooling channels, for example, there's no other way uh, to build them except 3D printing. 3D printing can produce incredibly intricate objects, and these objects are fundamentally impossible to build any other way. So it's well established in rocketry. Um, uh, also, because in rocketry you have usually low volumes, you know, so it's not so important that it's maybe at this point still a little bit more expensive sometimes. So, um, in uh, automotive, so Tesla, it's not so much a candidate. You know, Tesla uses a generative design to create new structures, and they have done some really interesting things. They, for example, sample done a, a heat exchanger for the Model Y which is extremely well designed. It's produced traditionally, 
but um, it definitely used algorithmic design to come up with a fantastic shape that saves a lot of energy. And so in winter, now the Model Y is one of the most efficient electric vehicles around because it doesn't use a stupid way of uh, heating up uh, the object, uh, the, the car. Um, I mean, I have an example here of a heat exchange that we did, and you can kind of see what kind of organic structures you can build using 3D printing and, uh, and uh, algorithmic design. I mean, there's no way in hell you would design something like that by hand. You know, I mean, you yeah. could do it, but it would take forever. And yeah. you know, if you made a small mistake, and you know, somebody said, "Yeah, you know, we we actually should, uh, you know, change the size of this thing a little bit," you know, the engineer would go bananas because that would take another two weeks or three weeks to model. You know, in algorithmic design, you just change the parameters that go into it, and the whole thing just regenerates and cr creates something new. So that's really a, a big potential uh, for innovation. So. You talked about sustainability in this new model, and you know I want to give you three main areas where I think um, this new type of production can actually have an impact on sustainability. I mean, first of all, material saving. So in traditional manufacturing, you basically you cut away material in most of the processes. And the more you have to cut away, the longer it takes. So you cut away much less than you should actually be cutting away. Um, so unless you have a really high requirement for lightweight uh, stuff, for example, in, in the aircraft industry or something like that, you usually keep stuff with way too much material than you actually need just simply to keep the production cost down. So that wastes so much material, it's just insane. And it has implications. It's not just the material that's wasted. And usually these things are heavier. And so when they're heavier, they also take more energy to ship, more energy to use. So you have all this kind of cascade of um, inefficiencies that happen just because the production process is um, focused on removing material. Now in additive manufacturing, you put just the particles in place that you need, which means the more particles you have to put in place, the longer it takes. So you actually have an incentive to use the least amount of material possible. And so all of a sudden you can start printing foams and, and things like that. I mean, here in this rocket, again, you know, you have these foam-like structures here, which save so much weight, but you would never do it in a traditional rocket simply because it would take a huge amount of time to mill it away, the material. So you don't do it. So maybe you do it in a rocket, but you wouldn't do it in a different product. So material saving is one thing. Then the other thing is um, you can use one material and modify the material properties as you print versus using different materials. So one of the huge challenges that we have in waste disposal is and recycling is that we have you know, different materials that are all glued together and then, you know, compacted together. So basically the only thing you can do after, you know, you throw it away is burn it, yeah, which releases all the CO2. But if you want to do some recycling, it would be ideal if the whole thing was made from one material. Now, the interesting thing is through these structures that I can create using 3D printing, I can actually make materials that are relatively hard, I can make them soft by creating you know, a foam-like structure, for example. So the whole thing is made from one material, uh, but um, it, is, it feels differently. And so this is something you cannot do in traditional manufacturing. You always, I mean, traditionally we choose uh, different materials for different purposes, and then we glue or screw it together, and then we have the final object. And then you know, when you wanna reuse the materials, then you're out of luck, kind of. But I think the biggest, biggest um, impact on sustainability is just going to be innovation. Um, if you look at breakthrough innovation in many, many fields, you know, I think this is really where we should focus our energy. I mean, it's one thing to kind of reduce and, um, and save. And that's really, really valid. You know, people saying, hey, you shouldn't fly, you know, with an airplane all of the time. I mean, right now you can't. But um, in the end, this pandemic has also shown us that we can't save our uh, way out of the climate crisis, for example. So, yes, of course, you know, basically there are all the flights are grounded, you know, people are not driving their cars much, you know, because where can you go when you're not allowed to, to visit your your family. 
But still, if you look at the reduction in CO2 emissions, it's actually not that big. You know, I think we had like 20% or something like that in reduction. Yeah, it's not that big. Yeah, it's, it's like, of course, it's great. But it just shows you, I mean, we shut down the entire world. But it has made a dent of, yeah, 20%, and not, not 80%, not 90%, not 100% by far. You know, it's, it's, it's just a small dent. So what this means is we have to replace what is currently there with ways that are 100% sustainable. And sustainable means you know, zero carbon emissions, uh, you know, uh, zero waste fundamentally. You know. It's interesting, actually nature wastes a lot if you look at it i mean this tree shedding its leaves every uh, you know autumn you know what a waste you know it should have saved it but because it's a circular way of dealing with things you know it actually isn't isn't a problem actually it gives um, it, you know it, it creates new life you know by shedding the leaves you know it creates the uh, the fertile ground for the next uh, uh, tree to to grow so we have to think along these lines and i think additive Manufacturing is one really key component in that, you know, circular economy thinking in this breakthrough innovation thinking, you know, new batteries, you know, electric mobility and these kinds of things, you know, using less materials, yes, but uh, first and foremost, creating new ways of doing things that uh, will help us innovate our way out of this crisis. Well, one thing that people don't realize is they think, okay, <clears throat> they kind of get in this trap that only the flight shaming or that only the flights are the segment of the carbon emissions. And, and there's such a, a small segment uh, of the savings because actually shipping transport can, went up and uh, as well as that, as well as trucking logistics went up. Um, so you've got those diesel and those emissions from those two things, but, but the other fallacy that many people believe is that these greenhouse gas emissions come from the oil, coal, and gas industry, from the automotive industry. They're on the list of the top 10 emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, but they're not on the, in, the, in the top half. They're at the bottom half of the top 10. Um, the top half of that is the agriculture, food, and beverage industries because we continue to eat, and we've seen a lot of waste in food because there weren't migrant workers to harvest that because where uh, the way people's habits now change during the lockdown and what they eat and things, a lot of emissions go up there. And it, it was really minuscule what, what, the, what that stop did. And it affected, it did a ripple effect of, uh, of many other people. With what you just said, there was one other thing and I wanted to maybe address it and see if it's similar. It's a little bit of a different example but during this lockdown and pandemic, there was this battery day launch from Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I know you 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 drive a, a Tesla, I don't know if it's a roaster since 2012, but yeah. um, uh, uh, I, the reason I bring it up is because a lot of people were really disappointed, especially the media was disappointed because they were expecting to see a new product. They're like, oh, there's gonna be this new battery day product. But what the launch was really about is saying, we're going to turn our manufacturing from a gigafactory to, I think the right word is a Terra factory. Is that the right term? Um, so basically, their manufacturing, their production, the way they do it is, is double more efficient now, which is a huge thing around sustainability, around emissions, around all sorts of things, which is a groundbreaking way and the efficiency of those batteries that they do produce has actually extended the the the, um, the drive time on, on, uh, uh, on those batteries the charge time and things like that and um you think giga to terra maybe it's because people don't understand those exponential numbers or that that the the greatness of that they're like oh that's nothing but in 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 same respects from what i'm hearing from you what i've seen what i know it's also an exponential technology. It's also something that improves efficiency. Change is a game changer to bring industries out of the dark ages on a different way of pr pr production manufacturing. And uh, it's more than a tweak or an add-on of efficiency. It's a true game changer in an exponential way. And uh, do you 
Do you see that as well? Can you give us some more numbers or statistics or maybe some things that we're not seeing or understanding correctly, similar to that analogy I gave you on the battery day? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, part of it has to do with the fact that we humans are really hard. I mean, it's really hard for us to imagine exponential things. And um, actually it's really hard for us to imagine imagine truly new things happening. Nobody saw the smartphone coming, for example. You now all of a sudden it was there. And actually when Steve Jobs introduced it in 2008, most people didn't really get it, you know? I mean, nobody, I think, not even Steve Jobs would have foreseen that, you know, by now it's become an integral part of our body, essentially. You know, I mean, if you leave your key at home, that's fine, you know, but if you leave your cell phone at home, you definitely go back because it's like leaving your head at home or something. So, um, you know, it's really hard for us to really see what's coming down the pipe and so i think it's as as you said you know i think it's hard for people to realize what an impact this incredible advance in battery technology will actually have i mean i'm always confused you know that there's still these people running around telling everybody uh, renewable energy yeah that can't work because there's no base load you know so what if the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow well storage you know, it's not that difficult. You know, I've been doing it for a while. You know, every combustion engine car has a battery that stores the energy so that it can run the next day. So, um, you know, we are going to do the same thing with, with renewable energy. And, you know, in fact, I'm, you know, I'm on the board of uh, directors of a company called Vault Storage that is doing exactly that. And, you know, it's just a question of rolling these technologies out. And then the problem actually goes away. And, uh, you know, then the energy grid is more resilient, et cetera, et cetera. But people actually usually don't understand, you know, the impact that these single technologies have, you know. And one of the interesting points of frustration for me at Hyperganic is and was that you show them something that's quite relevant. You show people something that's quite relevant to their industry and say, hey, you realize you know, once this is done, it's going to completely disrupt what you're doing. And they said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Call me when it's ready. And you're like, you don't get it. You know, once it's ready, you're, you're I mean, you're out of business. That's it. You know, I mean, there's, there's no way to catch up once this is ready. I mean, why don't you do it? And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're monitoring the market. We're looking, you know, what's coming down the pipe. You know, they're like, wait a second. The market isn't something that is done by some natural force or something. It's people doing it just like tesla did it i mean when i test drove the tesla roadster in 2012 i bought the last red one that was available in europe um i was fascinated i said wow this is a game changer i mean i didn't actually i mean as you said i have five kids what do i want to do with a two-seater car it's like the most ridiculous uh, purchase i've ever done but I realized that this is going to be, this is the car that's going to change the car industry forever. And it's going to lead us to sustainable transportation. The car isn't the greatest way of transportation, but it's still going to be a significant form of transportation for many years to come. And uh, this is the car that started the EV revolution, finally. You know? And actually, without that car, I don't think the EV revolution would have happened until now. So, um, Yes, it's incredibly hard to tell people what's going to come down the line, especially if you also don't know it quite exactly. Because I also, I mean, we are creating technology that fundamentally means, if you think about it, that you can include functionality for free. Because, I mean, once it's in an algorithm, I mean, the incremental cost of including some functionality in your thing, in your widget, is, is basically it will go down to zero, you know? So just like a microchip, I mean, microchip used to be so expensive that we put it in a socket so that when the rest of the PC broke, you could remove the microchip from the socket and put it into another computer because it was so expensive. Now today, if you buy a, a jacket, you know, there is a tag and the ta tag includes a microchip. And what do you do when you uh, get home? You tear off the tag, you throw the microchip in the trash. So microchips are now free, basically. 
And that's basically going to happen with all kinds of functionality because it's, you know, once you use a 3D printer, the complexity doesn't matter anymore. Once you use algorithmic design, it doesn't matter whether you include the functionality or just leave it out. I mean, there's going to be a tiny little surcharge, but it's it's not going to be relevant, just like, like it's not relevant whether you include a chip in the paper tag or you don't include the chip. So how will a world look like where functionality is free? What would you build? And I honestly, I, I know that this, this is coming, but I have no idea. I mean, I can imagine some things, but I'm probably completely wrong. You know, it's just like, you know, if you look at predictions of the future from like a hundred years ago, I mean, you're kind of laughing, you know, you're, you're saying this is ridiculous, you know, um, I mean, they're still using, I don't know, you know, uh, cathode ray tubes as, as displays or something like that. And of course we have, you know, basically thin films we can stick on the walls that show pictures now. So people didn't see that coming. And so we, were, we are not going to see a lot of the things coming that uh, are going to be completely normal in 10 years from now. So um, that's why it's even more important to get on the bandwagon and get going and try to build these things because these changes, they happen so quickly. I mean, 15 years ago, you would still print a, a paper poster to advertise, uh, for example, a, a, a talk you're giving. Now today, you just put a flat, flat panel display up and you, know, you change, just change it digitally. You, know, you, you now have in supermarkets, you have tags that display the price and basically a little display. If you told somebody 20 years ago, yeah, you're gonna have lots of displays, you know, in the supermarket that display the prices instead of having some guy, you know, go there, you know, to 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 put like little paper tags on it. They would have looked at you as like ridiculous. A display costs so much money. Your your entire life centered around one display you had in your living room. I mean, we used to connect computers to this one display, the TV set, you know, because we didn't have a separate display for the computer. Now everything has a display, so these things are going to happen relatively quickly and they're going to have a profound influence on our lives. And I can't for the life of me figure out why so few people are interested in these changes. Yeah, I, I, well, they definitely don't understand the exponential function and how quickly the, the changes will occur. But I also, with, with companies and organizations where they say, we're watching, we're monitoring the market, it's almost this thought of the invisible hand, and it, it, which has been proven, it doesn't exist. This invisible hand doesn't doesn't exist. And then there's a lot of people who, and organizations, who are actually waiting for someone else to deliver the future to them, and then they're hoping to be quick enough to jump on that wave and ride it out or, or be there. And, and some can do it, and some might do it. But it's very tricky and it's very uh, there, there's also a cost to do that to wait and then hope that you can jump on and on that wave because it's entire organizational shift structure it's a new model of operating that looks much different than the one that they're waiting in they're waiting in this one model for this other to come but those two models don't align and to make that jump to the other, you're going to eventually have to sh change your vision and your operating model, your vision, the why of your organization and that business model to be able to make that jump. It's not something that just happens automatic. That in and of itself is, uh, it is there's, there's a dollar amount. There's a way to figure that in to, to your organization. And some people think that it's, Business as usual, we're watching and monitoring the thing that those companies were going to get a big wake up call because that just does not exist like that. Um, so I, you, said, I, you, you, yeah, go ahead. You, you said a really important word, word, though. So people have to adjust their vision, but I would I would actually challenge you because I think the biggest problem that most companies face is that they don't have a vision. They don't actually know where they want to go. So they are, they're basically just reacting to this invisible hand and the invisible hand, well, it's not, it doesn't exist. It's people, it's other entrepreneurs building the future. And now they have to react and somehow fit in and hopefully it, you know, they can do it before, you know, their uh, segment like the German car industry just completely collapses, you know, all of a sudden. So, so what I can't, understand really is 
why there are so few people and by extension so few companies um, that actually have a wish for the future. I mean, how the future should look like. What world do they actually want to live in? Because, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, the pandemic has shown us that you can't just take the current world for granted. And quite frankly, the current world isn't that great. I mean, there's a lot of things you could actually improve. Concrete things that you and your children will actually appreciate. So why are there so few people out there who actually say, yeah, actually, let's build a world, you know, that is like this, you know, like I envision it. And maybe we can disagree on the visions, but, you know, I prefer people with visions a hundredfold to people who just sit there and say, yeah, you know, let's see what comes. And, you know, if something comes, then maybe I react. Yeah. And that's, I think, one of the biggest issues when in mature industries and in mature markets and in mature countries like Germany, I mean, we've gotten really, really fat and, and, um, yeah, comfortable in the status quo. And um, I think we need to change that. And maybe the pandemic is a good way to remind us that uh, we can't take um, the world for granted. And maybe there's actually a better world we should be working towards. Yeah, to, 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 to get fat and, and comfortable uh, as a sure way that the pandemic will get you, those are two things that actually uh, makes puts you in a high risk category, so to say. Um, but you've opened up perfectly um, the opportunity of what my really hardest question for you today, and and uh, what I really want to know because you are a visionary, because you have that vision. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although we've been saying it for at least twelve months now. Um, it's what's the future? Uh, and even more so, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? So I, I kind of would like to, whether you do it in, in hyper, hyper uh, organic uh, answer, or if you do it for your vision, what's the plan? What's the future? Yeah, well, easy question last, right? You know, so, um, <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, I think um, the future is going to be a nice place, a place, place we actually want to live in. You know, I, I think one of the issues that I see frequently is that, you know, visions of the future are usually dystopic. You know, if you look at science fiction today, I mean, it's basically, it's like, uh, I mean, it's, it's techno pessimistic. So technology always, you know, takes over and kills all the humans and, you know, makes everything terrible and, uh, I don't know, right? You know, The Matrix, you know, anything alien, you know, whatever movie you look at, you know, it's like horrible, you know? Um, so I think the future is going to be a really nice place, you know, where people can really comfortably live, you know, where they don't actually have to worry about a lot of the things that we currently have to worry about. Um, I think it's going to be a place of abundance just simply because it's the natural state of the world, if you think about it, you know, um, nature is incredibly abundant, you know, I mean, like I said, I mean, the tree just throws all the leaves away, you know, it's not not a problem, you know, you don't have to save that one leaf, you know, and see, think of, you know, maybe reducing it by 20%. It's all fine, you know, it's a circular economy, it's, it, it, it works. So this is what I, what I see. And, you know, honestly, we are on a good path towards that. I mean, I think most people don't realize how simple actually a lot of the stuff that people may think is hard actually are. So think, take energy, for example. I mean, Germany is a really, really big energy consumer. So um, electricity in Germany is now almost 60% renewable. And that is from like a couple of years ago where it was like 10% renewable or something like that. So it's, it doesn't seem like it's that complicated, actually. You know, renewable energy is actually now the cheapest form of energy. And once we have energy storage, it's going to be a watershed moment because frankly, energy will be fundamentally free. I mean, it will cost almost nothing because, you know, once you have invested in all these energy producing 
methods, you know, hydro plants, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, wind, uh, solar, et cetera, you know, geothermal, uh, uh, you know, wave power, you know, lots of things actually that people don't even talk about once you have invested in these. So the current cost is just investment cost. So once the investment is done, these things last really, really long. So it's not like you have to replace them every two years or something like that. So the energy costs is going to be incredibly low. So how, what would a world look like that has free energy? What would you do? And I mean, I can imagine a lot of things that I would do. I mean, for example, I mean, you, you would eliminate all the problems that we have with water shortages you know, everywhere. You know? So it's one of the biggest challenges all over the world is, you know, actually to get clean and, and, and you know, enough water. So if you have free energy, I mean, you can produce water, you know, from salt water, whatever, right? So there's, so to me, the world that we can work towards is a really, really positive one. And um, I think that is something that also all, uh, the, the green movement, you know, um, is sometimes forgetting. So they talk all about, you know, these terrible things that are going to happen. And, uh, you know, if we don't, uh, you know, work our way out of it, you know, the world is going down, etc. But we forget to tell people what the alternative is. The alternative is an incredibly beautiful and abundant world where people don't have to constantly think about, you know, whether they can do this or not, because, you know, it's gonna, I mean, can I eat this burger or am I really a terrible person, you know, because we are gonna solve this. This is not gonna be solved automatically. People need to solve it. And so please, you know, everyone, yeah, please get to work and solve these problems. I can also say it's incredibly rewarding to solve these problems because it's actually fun doing stuff that's relevant. I mean, if I talk to so many people out there, they are so unhappy with their lives, you know, because they are doing meaningless things. They know it's meaningless. So I always wonder, I mean, there's all these really interesting things that people could be doing. I mean, why don't you start doing it? And, you know, a lot of people are just afraid of change and stuff, but, you know, I actually think change is a cool thing because, there's the potential to change for the better. People are always afraid that things are going to be bad, you know, when they when things change. But you know, hey, they could actually be good. You know, why are we actually not pushing towards positive change? So, um, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that a lot of people also forget, and this is a, a huge part of my vision for the future, is that technology plays a huge role in this. So. No, we are not going to go back to the caves. This is going actually. If we all went back to the caves, it would be an environmental disaster. You know, billions of people making their own little fires in their caves. You know, wow, no, we don't want that. You know, we actually want a future that's super modern, includes a lot of technology to help ease our lives, um, but a future that is sustainable in all kinds of ways. You know, sustainable in terms of it sustains humanity. It sustains your know, ecolo ecological eco uh, you know, ecosystem, you know, our ecological framework. But um, yeah, it's also sustainable in, in terms of that people feel um, happy living in this world. So it's not like a world that, yeah, you, you, we, we barely get by and yeah, we save the planets from collapsing, but we are living in eternal misery, trying not to breathe and not to, to, to board our airplanes. Actually, I think air travel is, is super important because it connects people. You know, one of the things I, we, we touched on it earlier and, uh, you know, one of the things I'm really concerned about is that people all of a sudden stop traveling, that people stop talking to other people, that people think, you know, oh yeah, I, I have to hunker down in my little circle and, you know, only exchange my, my uh, you know, my ideas with, with, you know, the nearest neighbors. The opposite is uh, what is going to, um, to, to be necessary to overcome a lot of these challenges. And you know, in, in the future that I envision, you know, people travel everywhere all the time, probably multiplanetary, you know, if Elon you know, is successful with that venture as well. 
and um, uh, again, you know, it's a future of abundance, you know, where um, we don't have to think so much about, you know, whether something we do has like a terrible ecological footprint, because the technology that we're going to use is by itself going to be sustainable. You know, this is really what we are trying to move forward. And um, I think there's a good chance to do it. I mean, I witnessed the entire PC revolution, you know, from my childhood to the days now. And um, it's so funny, you know, when the first microchips were invented and the first computers were introduced, everybody thought, oh, that's great. We have a replacement for this mechanical calculation machine that uh, I used to have. So that's great. You know, it uses less energy and, uh, you know, I can do my calculations a little bit faster. But they completely missed that this was the um, beginning of a complete revolution in how we do business, you know, how we communicate, you know, how we interact, you know, how we do almost everything. And it's all because of the invention of the computer. And I think we're at this stage now with manufacturing, you know, where manufacturing is taking the next step. So manufacturing in the next 10 years is going to change more significantly more than in the last 100 years, because we're going from these highly specialized, really complicated way of building things and engineering things to a world where we can define once you know how certain things are modeled and constructed and then we have a really flexible production method that can be improved every time you know something is manufactured and so i think this is uh, even i i don't i don't think i can estimate the impact it's going to have but it's going to be as profound as a microchip I, it definitely is, and, and it's a beautiful transition and vision that you set, and I know that you're part of it, and um, that, that it's a very hopeful and optimistic one. Uh, it's more that we need to also see and, and kind of have that vision repeated for us, because currently our, most of our media is very negative and dystopian, so the more we hear the positive stories or we see manifestos or visions or media that show us kind of what that could look and feel like from those early adopters from those innovators and those visionaries that maybe at first they need to do it in 3d or animated or somehow to to give us a kind of a feeling of what that would look and feel like to live in that future but i i know that 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 we will get there that we can innovate a, a better future for sure I have, I have three last questions for you, and it's really um, for my guests. It's kind of something to give back to them that they can maybe apply. The first one is, if there was one method you could depart to, to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Um, well, it's something very abstract. I mean, take initiative. You know, take initiative um, and build something. You know, um, I see so many people who kind of fit in their current life the, that they built, and they forget that they can actually create something completely different. And you know, I do a lot of mentorship with with young people, and you know, it's it's a couple of sentences that you say to them, and all of a sudden something starts. And I, I just hope that more people can see that what they are currently doing and how they are doing it is just one way of doing things, and that they could actually radically change certain aspects. And you know, we are all builders, we are all creative people, and um, I would really wish that more people become entrepreneurial or just builders, you know, create something new instead of kind of fit into the current way of doing things. Because that's where all this, that's where the invisible hand comes from, right? Yeah, yeah, it's doing nothing. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh, wow, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's one thing that, um, that I really wish I had known earlier. Um, building something big or building something small takes the same amount of effort. So, you know, when, 
you know, when, when you're young, you don't have any experience, you don't know what you're capable of. So you always try to do things, you know, maybe a little bit more safely than you should. But the opportunity cost actually when you're young is zero. You know, you can do whatever you want and nobody will ever blame you, you know, 10 years later. So I, I would say, you know, if, if somebody had told me that when I was young, that the amount of effort that it takes to build something larger is exactly the same thing as if you build something smaller, I, I think it would have given me a little bit of a jump start sometimes. But um, fundamentally, the most important thing is that you actually build something, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how big or small or whatever, it's really important to build something. I, I totally agree with you there. And I've experienced that numerous times that and I've, I've learned it through the hard way is that, uh, you know, the amount of energy, the amount of effort to build something small is actually the, almost in some respects, the same amount of energy, the same amount of effort, uh, the same paperwork and planning and speaking to those people to build something that's really large. Um, and, and there's there's always this economy of scale or the sweet spot in, in those where you say, well, and, and this is the vision of the size that I want to be in the future. And, and uh, in order to reach that, there's also got to be that sweet spot, that economy of scale. And so if you say, oh, well, what's the what's this thinking of let's do the bare minimum, let's here's the bar and the standards set by the government or laws or rules or whatever, let's just meet that. Well, why don't we not let those apply to us at all and shoot and set the bar so much higher to get to the future and really get us to the future? Yeah, I've re really the experience that so many times with, with other things. And then they try to take a complete system and break it down to its individual siloed facets, which is another frustration I have, but this is really the last question that I have is, is what should young innovators in your field be thinking about uh, if they are looking for ways to have a true impact? I, I'm sure you've mentioned some of them, but is there anything else that you would depart? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, especially in my field, I think people are I mean, like like with the mechanical calculator versus the microchip, you know, um, people think way too conservatively. So I think people really need to think along the lines of, you know, we can now move atoms in space. Um, how how should stuff look like if you can just put the atoms exactly where you need them? and not really be concerned about, you know, how things looked like in the past. And um, if people think in their field along these lines, they can come up with radically improved objects compared to what we have today, because all the objects around us right now are a function of their manufacturing process fundamentally. And um, now if you say, you know, let's forget about the manufacturing process, let's just place atoms in space, you know, you have like, it's almost like an inkjet printer that prints three dimensionally, you know, so what would you build? Um, it's really tough because, you know, we have, we've, we have been trained to think along the lines of how stuff looked like uh, in the past. But once you kind of separate yourself from that, you know, you will come up with really, really cool breakthrough innovations. And maybe you need a couple of iterations and increments, you know, before you get to the really crazy thing. But, you know, please don't get stuck with the stuff as it is right now. Um, kind of wipe the, uh, the, the slate clean and there's, it's terrible. I mean, it's terrible to have a blank canvas. You know, what do you want to draw now? But wipe the slate clean and try to come up with a functional aspect of what you're actually trying to achieve and then think things completely new. And once you get there, I mean, we are going to see the innovation that we actually need in order to, um, to solve these challenges of our time. So all of these challenges are perfectly solvable. You know, most of them are just solvable with technology. And we now just need the people to actually start doing it and the fundamental technology is there now so let's just go to work and do it lynn i thank you so much thank you for being on the show it's been a sheer pleasure we could talk for hours we could talk for days and uh, get into so much depth and substance but we're really out of time and i, I want to thank you it's been a sheer pleasure and i wish you a wonderful day if there's anything else last few words that you would 
like to depart to my listeners. Now's the time. Oh, Mark, no, thank you. I mean, I know that we can talk for days because we have done it in the past. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the in the end, you know, maybe the last word is, you know, just be a little bit more courageous and, and uh, don't take the world as it is, you know, because the world as it is was built by people. And uh, yeah, well, we can build the world as we want it. And um, yeah, the, the earlier we get going on it, the, the, the better. So, you know, please, you know, help us all, you know, and uh, make the future a fun place. I think uh, we all deserve it. So yeah, thanks, Mark, you know, for, for having me. And it's been a, a huge You're pleasure. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Lynn. And you have a wonderful day. Tell your lovely wife and your children hello for me. And we'll talk very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.